Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. It is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. In our lessons today, especially the Old Testament and the Gospel lesson, the Lord tells us about his vineyard, God's vineyard. What is that vineyard and what goes on within that vineyard? In the last week of his uh, life before the crucifixion and before the resurrection, Jesus told the three parables on Tuesday uh, that illustrated our lives of faith within his kingdom. Last week we had the first of those parables. It was the parable of the two sons that were working in the vineyard. Today he continues with this idea of the vineyard and what is that vineyard and what does the Lord expect of that vineyard. So those will be the thoughts that are reflected in our service this morning. This morning we follow the order of service of word and sacrament. You'll find that on page 26 in the front of your hymnal. But the service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, which is an insert in your bulletin for today. This is my father's world. So those who are here today, please join with us in singing uh, from the insert, this is my father's world. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have for the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Judah. 
judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not already done for it? When I expected it to produce clusters of grapes, why did it produce sour grapes? Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will become pasture. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled down. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or hoed, so briars and thorns will shoot up. I will also command the clouds not to pour rain on it. Yes, the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the planting that pleased him. He expected justice, but there was oppression. He expected righteousness, but there was an outcry. He ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. We now turn to the epistle lesson for today. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Paul speaks of that heavenly view that he has. Even as he is running his race in this life, he's always pressing onward to that heavenly glory that is above. Yet he does not only think of it as the future, he thinks of it as the present. That as he looks forward to what lies ahead, he is working all the more harder for the Lord and his kingdom here. He will produce fruits that the Lord is looking for in his life. We read from Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it yet, but there is one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and straining toward the things that are ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature continue to think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this to you too. Only let us think the same thing and walk in line with what we have already attained. Brothers, join together in imitating me and in paying attention to those who are walking according to the pattern we gave you. To be sure, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. I told you about them often, and now I am saying it while weeping. Their end is destruction, their God is their appetite, and their glory is in their shame. They are thinking only about earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. We are eagerly waiting for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, he will transform our humble bodies to be like his glorious body. Here ends the word of our Lord from the epistle. And in response to our first two lessons for the day, we join in the singing of hymn 457 in Christian worship hymnal. 457, please note the stanzas we sing, stanzas one and two of Fight the Good Fight. <laughs> Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 43. 
where the Lord again speaks of his vineyard and those who are taking care of his vineyard. It is the parable of the wicked tenants who did not provide for the landowner what he was looking for. We read in Matthew chapter 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. When the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. The tenant farmers seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then the landowner sent even more servants than the first time. The tenant farmers treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmer saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So when the landowner comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They told him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Then he will lease out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his fruit when it is due. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That is why I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruit. Here ends the reading of the gospel. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 528, Christ is our cornerstone.
This morning we look at the gospel lesson for the day, reading of Matthew chapter 21. I'll read just the opening verses one more time, beginning at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. When the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed and our Lord. What kinds of things do people own? Farms, lands, homes, a business, cars, and so much more. Children have bikes, they have toys. Nowadays, they even have cell phones. They have all kinds of video games, and again, much more. Even those who are the poorest among us have clothing, they have books, they have TVs, they have radios, and other things. Everyone owns something, some more than others, but each of us has many things. And you have to go beyond the things that we have, too. We have our minds, we have our abilities, we have our emotions, we have talents, we have gifts. And I think you could probably go on naming all kinds of things that we actually have and that we own. How thankful we can be for the things that each of us has. But lest we forget, we don't own anything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And the Lord himself said, whatever is under the heavens is mine. There's nothing that we have that is not his in the first place. And so often we act like it's ours. God's the owner of all. We are stewards who take care of the things that he has entrusted into our hands. Actually, like the hymn that we began the service says, this is my father's world. Let me never forget the Lord is king. This is our father's world. He is the owner of all. How does he approach the things that he owns? Surely as owner, he looks for something in return from it all. And Jesus tells us that in the parable today of the vineyard. Think of this vineyard as a patch of bright green and purple that is set on the hillside that is gently sloping. It's among the greenish gray of the olive trees and perhaps the darker greens of the figs. It's sloping towards the sunlight so that it might gain the best from that. And as one passed by that vineyard, one could tell that the man who owned this vineyard thought very highly of that vineyard and took pride in it. Everywhere that a person looked, there's signs of that owner's loving care. The owner had picked a choice spot for the growing of grapes, this hillside, which was bathed in the sunlight to help the grapes. All the stones in the field had been removed and they had been piled around the field so that a fence was made in order to keep out all the harmful critters, whether they were of four legs or of two legs. A watchtower was set in the middle of the vines so that the guards, the watchmen who kept watch over all things would see with their eyes the larger threats that could be threatening. The owner even went so far as to build a wine press in this vineyard, which was uncommon in the days. It was for the processing of his grapes, lest there be any risk in losing them as he sent them elsewhere. So it's very plain to see that this man spared no expense and went to great ends in order to make this vineyard the most fertile and the most productive that it could be. From such care, 
There are returns that are expected. He looked for fruit. After everything was ready, the owner went away for a time. And then he leased his vineyard to some tenants who would share in the labor and the joy of the harvest from that vineyard. When it came time to receive the fruit from that vineyard, the owner sent servants to collect his share. But then the renters seemed to forget to whom the vineyard actually belonged and who had put such great care and expense into developing it so that it would be the most productive vineyard around. Instead, they looked at the vineyard as if it were their own. So they made short work of the servants that had come to collect some of the fruits from there. And they sent them away on the end. The owner sent others. And the renters violently treated them, greeting them with stones. Still others received rougher treatments. There's only one thing left to do, the owner said. I will send them my son. When they see my dearly loved son, they will surely respect and honor him. As the son was approaching, the wicked renters put their heads together. Here's the heir, they said. If we get rid of him, the vineyard's going to be ours. Now, how in the world could that happen? Such foolish thinking. But an outright rebellion against the owner, who had never done anything but good, they killed his son, and they threw his lifeless body outside of the vineyard. And at that point of the story, Jesus stopped. And he turned to the priests who were listening, and he asked, what do you think that owner will do to those workers when he comes himself to his vineyard? I think the priest must have shifted rather uncomfortably from foot to foot here. For the master preacher, Christ, had so involved them in this parable that when he came to the time for this question, they were trapped having an uneasy feeling and suspicion that Jesus was really talking about them. Yet they answer, he will destroy those wicked servants, he will rent out his vineyard to other workers who will give him a share of what he is due of the fruit. And as those words fell from their lips, they must have realized that they had just condemned themselves even as they spoke. These priests, because like the workers in the story, they were plotting in their ungrateful and rebellious hearts how they could get rid of Jesus. God's dearly loved son. So did they repent? Did they fall on their faces and beg for his pardon? No. In fact, their anger and their resentment all against him only grew stronger as they increased their desire to get rid of him. And with sadness, Jesus must have looked at them. These were his people. Like the renters in the story, they had refused to recognize that the one person who could help and save them was actually standing right in front of them. They would not submit they would not agree that they had abused his things and needed him to be saved. He said to them, do you know that verse from the Old Testament? God has made the very stone which the builders have rejected into the cornerstone of this house. The man who stumbles over that stone will be broken into pieces. The priest couldn't answer, but they only stared at Jesus with cold and bitter hatred. 
Yes, they had stumbled over Jesus, who was God's foundation stone for salvation that had been laid from the very beginning of this universe. And in their abuse of and hatred for him, they would be, be destroyed in the same way that they had said the crooked renters of the vineyard would be destroyed. Unrepentant and self-condemned, they remained. But Jesus' story is not just about a farm or a vineyard. It's a story about the people to whom he spoke in his day. And he still speaks to us today. And what of us? We Christians are the modern day workers whom God has taken into his vineyard, which stands for his church. It's his, you know. He is the owner. And the question is, what have we been doing with his things? There are other places in the Bible where Jesus speaks of us as vines within his vineyard. Maybe it seems strange to us to think of ourselves as vines planted in a vineyard. But a vine is there to produce fruit. And the fruit is for the one who planted planted and nurtured and cared for that vine. We are surrounded all around us by God's loving care. We become so accustomed to that we, that we are tempted to not consider it like we should. Aren't our lives simply filled overflowing with his special mercies and his da daily grace and blessings? The greatest of which is the sending of his son to be our savior. If you should count those blessings and the greater ones that still lie ahead, as Paul says, as he has a heavenly view of what lies ahead of him and the race that he is running, do you think you could ever stop counting all of them? This is our father's world. He's the owner. He has so generously turned it over into our hands. But more than the world, he has given us all by faith in Christ a place within his church. He has seen to it that his word protects us and that it is present always to enrich our lives. And he looks for a return. What farmer or husbandman plants his fields, works his land, puts everything into his vineyard that he can, does all that he can to make the things productive, but does not expect to get something back in return? See, by grace we've been placed in Christ's vineyard, like the renters in this parable. And he has given us a part in the production and in the reception of the rewards. Dare we rob that owner of the fruit that he has a right to expect? He really cultivates us with such care. He gives and he gives and he gives some more. And the greatest gift of all being that son of his who willingly paid the price for our sins so that, like Paul, we may rejoice in that upward look of heaven that lies before us, guaranteed to all who believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. God grant that we would never, in foolish complacency, despise his gifts to us, but ever prove faithful and fruitful and responsive to the owner of all who has so graciously enriched our lives in every way. The owner looks for fruit. God grant that they see that fruit in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
And now we unite with all Christians in confessing our faith. Today we do that in the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 31 in the front part of the Christian worship hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue with the prayers for the day. At this time, our offerings are not uh, given during the service itself, but you'll find the offering plate at the door as you leave this morning. So if you would please turn to page 32 and join with me in the responsive prayer of the church. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand. The beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament today. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen Amen. us with this heavenly food. Increase Amen. our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we would easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Heavenly Father, our Creator, help us to put to best use all your gifts your talents, the abilities, the creativity, and the imagination that you have given in your service to you. We offer ourselves to you this day, Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. May you control our thoughts and may we embody your love, for you are the cornerstone of salvation, the cornerstone of our faith and our hope. We consecrate ourselves to you this day, Holy Spirit, our Counselor, for you guide us in the way that we should go within your kingdom and within our Lord's vineyard. Inspire our speaking, sanctify our actions, and cause us to be burning with zeal for you, who with the Father and the Son are one God who provides for all our needs. Be with our friends and our family and members here who are suffering through illness at this time. Keep them strong in body and especially in heart and in soul as they look to you for all good things. And now hear us, dear Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now,
Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has taught us to join in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we now continue with the order of Holy Communion on page 33 in the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Savior Jesus Christ. 
given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood given a shed for the forgiveness of all sins strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood and given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Please rise, and if you would join in the singing of the Song of Thanksgiving, you'll find that on page 36 in the front of the hymnal.
hear may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve our Lord in gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. The congregation may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. We join in the singing of hymn 559, Lord of the Living Harvest. Again, we welcome all of you to our service today and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. For you who are online, we will be here again next week at the same time, so we invite you to join us at this time next week also for our service. And uh, may the Lord bless you in all your endeavors in the week that lies ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm.